Absolute software. How many people know Absolute? Quite a few, awesome. If I said LoJack for laptops or CompuTrace, would that ring a bell for most of you? That's Absolute, among many other things. So before we get started, happy Pi Day. Hope everybody has Pi today. I got an argument with my fiance this morning about the fact that I do not believe chicken pot pie counts as Pi Day. Closer or further? Closer? Better? Okay. So before we get started, some disclaimers. This broadcast property, oh shit, sorry. I always wanted to say that, so. But seriously, the opinions expressed during this discussion do not necessarily reflect that of my employer, so please don't fire me, okay? Thank you. And then I have some uh, trigger warnings. Um, in all cases where required, PII has been redacted, uh, even for the guilty. Um, I try not to name and shame. Um, some case files I'm going to discuss do contain references to drugs, pornography, prostitution, and child pornography. So if that's sensitive to you, I would suggest maybe you remove yourself or just plug your ears. Uh, just don't want anybody to get upset. Um, I'll try to keep this to 30 minutes, but I have 53 slides, and I highly doubt I'm going to keep it to 30 minutes because I'd like to give out a bunch of swag here. I did ask for permission before we started if I could give away some swag, so they said it was okay. This is stuff I have left over from RSA, so I'm happy to give it out. Um, I know it's the one o'clock talk, so a lot of people might fall asleep after lunch. I know I do, so I'll just whip these little squids at you. No big deal. Okay, so what am I gonna talk about today? Um, what's the problem with stolen devices? Stolen devices continues to be a huge problem for enterprises today. Um, we don't think it is. I mean, the commoditization of devices has made things incredibly cheap, but there's a lot of data on those devices, and I'll talk about that in a minute. I'm going to share some case file files for you guys about how devices are typically stolen, at least those that are reported to our investigations team. What are the implications to you and your company when a device is stolen? Who are the people behind our investigations team? What do we typically do during an investigation? And then I'll share seven case, seven or eight case studies, and I'm going to actually read the case files. I've slightly edited them, so I'm just going to read from these. So I want to get to those because some of them are pretty involved and in-depth. And some are pretty remarkable, some of the ways these devices get used after they're stolen. And then I'll briefly touch on the difficulties in dealing with law enforcement when it comes to dealing with stolen devices. Hopefully we'll have time for QA and hopefully I have time to whip some t-shirts out in the crowd. Couldn't find a t-shirt cannon on short notice, so uh, you'll just have to deal with my crappy throwing arm. So thefts of laptops, mobile devices happen every single day in the enterprise. Um, it's obvious that, you know, my first laptop was five, six thousand dollars. I mean, how many people remember when laptops were that expensive? Right? They were pretty pricey devices. And, and I think it was drilled home to us then, 10, 15 years ago, that if you lost that laptop, it was your butt. Threat butt, by the way. Someone asked me about that. It's not dick butt, it's threat butt. So, uh, anyways, but today, laptops being effectively worthless as far as the value of the hardware, people don't really care that much about the value of the device anymore. They, you know, throw it in their bag, leave it in their car. How many people leave laptops in their car? Be honest, because I do it and I shouldn't do it. And I know better. Um, the users don't really care. There's no real intrinsic value in the hardware anymore. And then because laptops and mobile devices have become such a commodity, law enforcement doesn't care about really finding uh, stolen devices anymore. Stolen devices are everywhere. They end up in pawn shops, they end up in Craigslist, and I put the Craigslist picture up there just because it's the hooded hacker who's like doing criminal enterprise on Craigslist. But um, I can tell you that my laptop got stolen once from the office, and it took 17 phone calls to get the RCMP to come in and take a look, and the only reason they did is because um, I made it clear there was some pretty sensitive data on it that needed some additional um, investigation. And then they came, but for most people, they don't care. But you take a look on Craigslist, I found that device on Craigslist six months later because I had a special search for it. I had a special hardware configuration. I had ripped out the DVD drive and put a second hard drive in it. So not many of those show up for sale on Craigslist. So the one that came up, I investigated. What typically happens when a laptop is stolen? Well, typically, you know, thieves try and just make quick buck, snatch and grab. You know, uh, they want to sell it quickly for pennies on the dollar on Craigslist or pawn it off at a local pawn shop, although that doesn't happen as much as it used to. Um, but then again, it doesn't always happen that way, and that's what we're going to get to. 
how are devices typically stolen? So for us in our investigations team, number one by a mile is people leaving it in their cars and someone seeing it and then either stealing the car or stealing, uh, breaking in and stealing the laptop. Um, people do watch you take your laptop bag out of your car and put it in the trunk and then you walk away. Listen, it doesn't take much effort to break into a car. Crowbar, some elbow grease, you can be in a couple seconds. These guys can break into cars as fast as you can snap your finger and then be gone. Um, snatch and grab still happens. I can tell you of a time I was at the BPL downtown here, sitting there just doing some studying, and uh, I watched from the other side of the room as a dude snatched a laptop off the table and made a bowl for it, and then down the stairs and out. And I think the security guard clotheslined him out the door, but the fact is it happens. And then internal theft continues to be a massive issue, especially in schools and hospitals. And why in schools and hospitals as opposed to the enterprise? Certainly internal theft does happen in enterprise, but in schools and hospitals, there's a, there's a very large disparity in, in the types of employees that you have, including the income levels of those people. And um, a lot of people find, for me talking to investigations team and, and some post-mortem recovery, um, a lot of these people feel slighted by the fact that there's people they work with who make a lot more money than them, and, and they feel kind of, you know, bitter. And they'll often steal devices for that reason. I mean, I'll talk about a case where someone just felt like they were entitled to the device after they retired, so they stole it. What are the implications of a device being stolen? Well, storage is almost free these days. Uh, it's as cheap as it's ever been. I remember when I was in high school, the first one gigabyte hard drive, that well, was a long time ago, but I mean, it was $1,000 back then. It was a lot of money. And, and I remember saying, how could you ever fill up a gigabyte worth of data? I think I have like, it's insane. I have like a 12 terabyte array at home that stores all my 4K media and stuff. But storage has become so cheap these days that we literally store everything on our devices, personal and professional. How many people have personal information or photos on their work laptop? Be honest, a lot of people. And I have a feeling that a lot of people aren't putting their hands up because they don't want to get in trouble. And that's okay. Um, I do. Um, you know, the, the abundance of, of free and cheap cloud storage means devices and data is going to sync across your personal device to your professional device. That happens all the time. Um, think about the Sony hack. Um, all the data that was stolen or exfiltrated for, uh, from the Sony hack. How much? embarrassing emails and compromising information was found in that attack. So if you don't have precautions on your device to make sure that the, the information on it, if heaven forbid it was stolen by someone who knew enough to get into it and comb through it looking for compromising information, would you be able to protect the, the information on the device if it were stolen? And then mandatory breach notifications. You know in the U.S. like virtually every state in the U.S. has a unique breach notification law. It's insane. I mean, so you have to know every law in every state. So basically what you do is you find the one that has the most punitive and difficult data breach notification law, and that's the one you follow. But in Canada this year, I mean, there's new breach notification rules. The Securities Administration just published this. This was on the CBC yesterday or the day before. I don't remember. But this is coming. I mean, when a laptop is stolen, if you can't prove or verify that the data on that machine has been sufficiently protected through full disk encryption and other technologies, then you're probably going to trigger a breach notification. So you better make sure you have that stuff. Now, I saw this tweet last month and I saved it just because I thought it was interesting. And I don't know if I necessarily think it's the biggest problem in IT today, but it certainly is more important than people realize. Asset management is InfoSec's most serious technical problem and second place isn't even close. Now, if you think philosophically why that's the case, it's probably because if you don't have a good handle on the devices themselves, you can't protect them. If you have 10,000 devices in your infrastructure and you don't know about 1,000 of them, you have no idea of the security posture of those devices. Would people agree that IT asset management is still an interesting problem to be dealt with in the enterprise? Okay, I see a few nods. You get a t-shirt. So I'm going to talk about our investigations team. Uh, Bob the dog here is not on our investigations team. It's just a photo I saw. Um, but we have 50 people um, with uh, an average of 20 years of experience um, each. 
Um, they're ex-FBI, ex-military, DHS, police, government employees. And a lot of these employees we bring in, um, they're retired and they want something new to do and they have these, these in-depth tight networks of connections in law enforcement that makes investigating some of these stolen devices a little easier. And I'll go into that in a little bit. Um, but we also have some forensic professionals, healthcare professionals, especially when it comes to uh, electronic PHI, um, um, private health information. And then we have some privacy experts as well. So how does an investigation work? Well, if you're familiar with CompuTrace, you know CompuTrace is a, at least in Windows, it's a BIOS level agent that, that, that's implanted in the BIOS from the factory. It's a collaborative effort with a lot of OEM manufacturers that allows you to track a stolen device when it's reported. So if a device is stolen and you've purchased the product, um, the agent will call and say, am I stolen? Am I not stolen? And if we have a flag in our system saying the device has been stolen, it will wake up and it will call home and we'll start monitoring the device. Um, we'll be able to monitor information like local IP, routable IP, the MAC address of the device. Um, if it's a mobile device, um, We'll be able to report the phone number that's reporting in the ESN of the device, uh, all the basic hardware info. And, and basic hardware info is important only because it allows us to determine if the thief has changed any of the hardware out. And that happens a lot with a stolen device. They'll swap out the hard drive and put in a new hard drive and reinstall Windows and think that's enough. Of course, because the agent exists in the BIOS, we can then re-put the agent back into Windows and continue to monitor the device. Um, we'll be able to determine what versions of Windows uh, are running, what applications are running on the device. This just does allow us to collect as much information as possible to provide it to law enforcement. Um, and then if, if we make a connection to the device and we, we're unable to determine where the device is or who's stolen it, we can deploy a forensic toolkit to the device that will allow us to now do keystroke monitoring, screen captures, and you'll see why that's important in a couple slides from now. So our investigations team, because they are typically, have a lot of experience uh, dealing with and being law enforcement officers, they'll, they'll start to create a dossier of information. And uh, that dossier will include all this information we've already collected. They'll monitor the device for a while and, and try and determine um, who the person is who has the device. And, and that's largely because law enforcement is often overworked and underutilized or under-resourced. They don't have the time to do all the detective work. So if we can provide them a full file of all this information and just give them a file right, and say, look, we, we believe this is the person, this is who, where they live, this is their email address, this is what they've done on the device, police are much more likely to help you because you've done most of the work already. Um, with that information, it usually allows law enforcement enough um, information to be able to get a subpoena from the ISP for subscriber information. So whether mobile or home, internet connection, that allows us to verify exactly where that device is because we'll often get IP, IP information, it'll be like a block, it could be a, a street block that belongs to this IP block, but we won't know exactly which one it belongs to until we can subpoena that data. But what happens if the device never comes online again? Well, we're not magicians, we're effectively hosed, right? Usually what happens in cases like this is people just, they, they don't feel right about it or, or, or they, they, they think that maybe someone's paying attention to what they're doing or they're just a little skittish. They'll often just toss it in the garbage and it's, it's never seen from again. Um, what happens if the hard drive's replaced? Like I said, we have the ability to put the agent back on the device. What else can we do? So we have other technologies that we call device freeze where basically that's a, a, a last resort for us because what it does is basically effectively locks the device at the BIOS level and puts up a screen and says, this device has been reported stolen, it is the property of this company, please call us at 1-800 and, you know, and get this device returned. <laughs> but once that happens, the device will never be able to connect to the internet again until it's unlocked and um, we won't be able to do any, continuing, or any continuous monitoring after that. Uh, remote data wipe, in some cases that's important where the company doesn't really care about getting the device back, but they just want to know for sure that the data on the device has been deleted. Um, we can remotely encrypt the device on the data to protect it from being um, seen by anybody else going forward. We can also use forensic, especially in healthcare, to determine what data has been touched by the person who has the laptop. Did they view all this information? We can probably tell them what's happened there. Okay, I made it to the case studies, good, because these are the important ones. 
So I'm going to read from these, so I apologize that I'm reading a bunch of stuff, but uh, I want to make sure I get all the details. So case study one is a government official. This was um, this laptop was stolen from the office of a New York City commissioner's personal desk while he was away on vacation. I won't disclose the agency here for obvious reasons, although if you were decent to Google, you could probably figure it out yourself. There was an investigation already being conducted by the City of New York's Department of Investigation, which are staffed with New York City detectives, and they were initially unaware that CompuTrace was installed on the device. The laptop began connecting after the theft, three months after it was stolen. Soon after, we then started collecting forensic intelligence. The investigator we inside was able to identify a female user in Brooklyn and pass this info along to the detectives. The investigator provided info to the detectives that included some addresses seen in screen captures here and here because these people, most thieves are stupid. Like they will literally put their home address and their full name and then this one's even better. I'll get to this one in a second. The suspect was also seen logging into a City of New York payroll site, implying the suspect was a current or former city employee. You stole your boss's laptop, and then you used it to log in for your payroll. <laughs> okay. Um, one of the detectives informed us that the suspect was previously interviewed in conjunction with the theft and denied any knowledge of the laptop or how it ended stolen. The suspect was identified as the commissioner's executive assistant and was set to retire. A search warrant was obtained and delayed due to unforeseen circumstances. The laptop then stopped all connections to the internet. Police then surveilled the suspect's residence and determined the suspect went away on vacation. Two weeks later, another search warrant was obtained and executed. The woman was positively identified as the commissioner's executive assistant, arrested, and charged with grand larceny, criminal possession of stolen property, and they considered charging her with computer tampering charges because we had screenshots showing her reading her boss's personal and professional emails while she had the device. She pled guilty. I don't know if she lost her, her, her retirement or not, but um, how stupid can you be? You're that close to retiring and you just decide to steal your boss's MacBook? Was it 500 bucks worth it? Probably not. This one's kind of interesting because we still don't really know what happened. Uh, a laptop was reported, reported missing from a school and reported to us the same day. The file was then assigned to one of our investigators in APAC because post-theft connections showed it was now connecting in Vietnam. It took a few months before sufficient, sufficient intel was collected on the person using the device and then we deployed the device freeze. Within a couple days, the person sent an email and informed us that the laptop was assigned to him by his company, which was a major manufacturing company. His IT department had been informed, and as well as the laptop manufacturer. The computer vendor's account manager from Australia was initially uncooperative due to lack of awareness of our product, and it required the intervention of our alliance manager with that specific device manufacturer to smooth out the kinks. From the exchange with the manufacturer, we then identified another laptop that was reported missing from the same school district that was also in possession of the same manufacturing company. So two laptops went missing. We don't know where they went. They were sold to another company, a legitimate manufacturer. This is like a mega like multinational corporation. I won't name names, obviously. Um, both laptops were apparently among a batch of supposedly brand new or refurbished laptops purchased by the company. The vendor then agreed to provide new laptops to the company and the company agreed to send the laptops back to us after we guaranteed that the device would be properly uh, deleted. Uh, we were never able to get a definitive answer as to how they ended up resold by the vendor, but it's suspected that the laptops were sent back for warranty repair or return and the vendor resold them. Crazy. Theft and throb. Okay. The district attorney's office of a county in Texas reported several laptops stolen to their local sheriff's office, and the devices began connecting online about two weeks later. Notes in the case file indicated to contact an employee of the DA's office. The employee advised us that a former employer of that IT department was suspected of taking the laptops, but they didn't really have any proof. One laptop made a few connections, and then it went quiet. The laptop then became active very briefly four months later, 
And we were able to determine then that the laptop's hard drive had been swapped out and the OS was reinstalled. Contact was made with the assigned detective to brief him on these updates, and he asked about the other laptop that was stolen, if we had any information on that. But we didn't know there was another laptop stolen because it hadn't been reported to us yet. A lookup revealed that this computer was not reported stolen to us yet, and a check of our systems revealed that that computer was calling in from the exact same IP address as the one we were monitoring. But here's where it gets interesting. The DA's office couldn't find any record of the second device's serial number in their, their absolute tracking system, because we provide obviously a portal for people to track all their assets. It didn't exist in their system, but they bought it. So what happened? We then checked our systems again and learned that the device was in the customer's console of the suspect's new employer. So what the suspect did was deactivated it from our system and then reactivated it under a new employer, which was another state agency in Texas. He stole the laptop, turned off the thing because he had access to do so, but then turned it back on on another company. Okay. After numerous phone calls and emails with law enforcement, it was determined that moving this computer to the correct account back to the DA's office would tip our hand so it was determined that since both were calling from the same IP address, the original computer would be the continued target of the investigation. We would just ignore the second device for now. We then supplied connection laws to law enforcement in order to subpoena the ISP. The information from the ISP came back rather quickly and it showed the address of the suspect was the same address as the ex-employee of the DA's office. Both computers continued to connect from the same IP address. When the detective arrived, the suspect's initial story was that both devices were given to him as a parting gift. I want to work for this DA's office because if your parting gift is two free laptops, let's, uh, anybody ever got a free laptop from their employer after they quit? That wasn't part of maybe your termination package or your resignation package? Of course not. Suspect arrived at the sheriff's office and turned over three devices that belonged to the DA's office, another device that wasn't reported stolen, the person gave a confession to the detective. Charges are pending. Okay, so now we get to the really difficult stuff. And this stuff is uh, really hard to talk about, but it's important that people know that sometimes these devices get used in this way. So in December, a vehicle was stolen, and in that vehicle was a laptop belonging to a state agency in California. It was also stolen. It came online two weeks later. We deployed forensic tools to the device, and we determined that the, there were some suspicious images being viewed. They just they, they inferred a child exploitation. They weren't exactly child pornography. But we continued to watch the suspect, and things got worse, and he continued to view more and more awful images. And um, we then detected our, uh, I lost my spot. The detective was notified and involved another detective in their sex crimes division. A report was prepared and sent to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children along with 100 plus images. And once we got those images, we don't record any more images because we don't need to anymore. We'll just keystroke log and watch for connection logs. Uh, we don't want to subject our employees to this any more than anybody else, right? Um, a detective from the DOJ's Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force then took over the case. She sent warrants to the ISP for subscriber records. The information returned from the ISP confirmed the suspect and the address that we already had. A search warrant was executed on the residence, but no one answered the door. The door was then kicked in and taken completely off the hinges. The suspect was found inside, along with what they said was tons of computers and thumb drives. Everything was seized. The stolen computer was also there. The suspect was unco uncooperative until we showed him pictures of himself. Funny how that changes their, their thinking. He was initially arrested for receiving stolen property because then they can arrest him while they work out the other charges. The investigation continues and the detective predicts many child pornography charges will be forthcoming. So this is what they, they, they seized from this guy. Three CDs full of child porn, lots of memory sticks, two desktops, 11 stolen laptops. So not only this guy like a kitty porn freak, but he's like a kleptomaniac too. And 
payments. It just boggles my mind that this thing happens. So um, I've redacted a lot of stuff on this screen capture. This is some of our keycaps, just because some of this stuff is really vile, and I don't think anybody needs to be subjected to it. But this is what the guy was doing on this laptop. If you think that some devices that are being stolen out of your, your environments aren't being used for awful things, they probably are. This one's interesting because this guy was even more stupid. A laptop computer protected and managed by Absolute was reported stolen from a California school district. The computer did not connect to the internet for another five months when the user and the location of the computer was identified and we deployed our forensic tool set. The information gathered identified that the unauthorized user was an employee of the school district. An investigative summary report was generated and submitted to local law enforcement. Further investigation by the assigned detective then confirmed that the user was an employee of the school district, confirming our findings. A few weeks later, the assigned detective acted on the information given to them and attended the, the address of the suspect. When the employee was confronted by the detective and asked about the stolen laptop, he then gave the detective a different stolen laptop. Okay. He just thought this was... This, why would you just admit anything? I don't know. Um, it turned out that that computer was initially produced by the employee was a different laptop that was stolen but had not yet been reported as such. Upon further investigation and questioning by the detective, the employee retrieved the originally sought laptop from a nearby garbage can where the suspect had recently disposed of it. Further investigation by the detective revealed the employee was in possession of six total items belonging to the school district. The detective recovered two MacBooks, two projectors, one Dell laptop, and one iPad that had not been reported stolen either. Following the recovery, the hard drives of the recovered computers were examined with forensic software by the school district to determine the, how the devices were used after the theft. It was discovered that the computers contained pornographic images requiring further investigation by local Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. And that investigation is proceeding, but the employee has been suspended pending termination. So here's how we identified this guy. He was using the stolen laptop to buy things on PayPal, on eBay, um, put his shipping address in there, his real phone number. Um, he was posting on Facebook. He was reading his Yahoo email. And the worst part about this guy was he was a teacher at school. It's awful stuff. Okay, drugs. This is a little more cheery than chapter one. So not much, though. Um, this computer was stolen from a theft from an automobile. Again, stop leaving cars in your laptop, people. Stop leaving cars in your laptop. I guess I need another drink, right? <laughs> it appeared online a couple weeks later. Forensic tools showed several names, addresses, and identifications, and it soon became obvious that this was a fraud in a stolen identity case. Our investigator that was assigned had a very good idea of the possible identity of the suspect, but wanted to collect as much information as possible to the local police so that the police could determine the actual identity of the suspect and the multiple names and addresses that this person was entering online. As it turned out, the suspect was well known to police and was already the subject of an investigation by multiple police departments and government agencies. The information we provided resulted in more investigation and culminated in a high-risk SWAT team warrant takedown. The computer was recovered, and as a result of this recovery, four people were arrested and charged with possession of stolen property, possession of heroin for the purpose of trafficking, possession of firearms by convicted felons, identity theft, and fraud. They seized hundreds of checks, hundreds of fake IDs, 10 grand worth of heroin, and four guns. So this person was committing identity theft logging into TurboTax, filing fake tax returns, um, manufacturing fake IDs on the computer. Of course, changing their address on the US Postal Service to their new address. I, I swear I could write a book for criminals on how to not be stupid. Why would you ever do this? Like, if you're gonna steal laptops, and like, if there's any criminals watching online, listen, just pawn the stuff off quick, take the cash, go buy a legit laptop, and then use that. 
not rocket science. Okay, pimping ain't easy. This one's a quick one, but it's kind of interesting in that um, residential B&E happened. I don't actually have a case file for this one because it's rather fresh. Um, but the local police department had no interest in investigating. They were just on the tax. They just didn't care. Um, our investigator then used his contacts in the local state police to get things rolling, which did happen. Um, we then were able to deploy forensic tools where we did some screen captures and key captures and found out that this person was operating a very, rather large prostitution ring on Craigslist using a stolen laptop. Okay, good for you. Um, but the state police asked us not to continue to investigate. They had enough information for us, and they are currently working on a sting operation to be able to arrest this person. Turns out that this laptop was not stolen during a B&E. &E. It was stolen by the person's spouse at their place of business and gave it to their spouse to use for this prostitution. Okay, uh, my last one right now is the Nigerian Prince. And this one's kind of interesting just because there's some really cool screen captures we were able to of here. Um, this laptop was stolen at the airport in Atlanta in 2015. Not too long later, it pops up in Nigeria. Turns out it's being used by someone in a massive international identity fraud and spear phishing ring. And I got some cool screenshots here where they're talking about that. They were targeting the CEO, COO, CFOs of some major, major large international companies. Um, we then handed our complete dossier off to the Secret Service in Interpol and they are now taking care of it. But you can see here that this person, and I know it's hard to see, the projectors aren't the greatest, but this person would create a, a rather large tax file. I'm going to click it here. You can see they've managed to capture all this information from this person. They already know how much credit they have on their credit card, their name, their address, their phone number, all this information. They end up, and I got a screenshot that will show it, they end up going into this person's online banking account and requesting a credit increase, uh, change of address, shipping a card somewhere else so they can start using it. Um, another one here, this is part of their targeted spear phishing campaign. So this is their dossier that they keep of all their targets. So they'll identify a bunch of targets, including their position and their rank and um, how they can get a hold of them. And then they'll, they'll use their, their, their email systems to be able to send out these spear phishing attacks. And a lot of these were used for um, you know, money transfer scams. Um, hard to see, but again, same thing. This is another um, uh, batch file of uh, targeted uh, people that they were going to send spear, target spear phishing messages to. Um, it's just another picture of dossiers they were keeping hold of. And then here they are on this person's account, looking at their credit card balance and then changing the account balance so they can commit even more fraud. So that's all I have for case studies, but let's talk a little bit about dealing with law enforcement. So like I said, law enforcement really doesn't have the time and resources to deal with stolen devices. They just, I mean, to them, it's just a $500 laptop. It's in Canada, it's theft under $5,000. It's not really a big deal. They got more important things to do. Um, so what are you gonna do? I mean, you have to persist. Could you put a monetary value on the data on your laptop? What would be, if you had to put a dollar value on your laptop, I mean, forget the hardware. You, know, you probably have sensitive financial information in some cases. You might have intellectual property. You could have the source code. All this stuff's worth a lot of money. So if you can frame a discussion with law enforcement, it, it, making them understand that the value of the laptop goes far beyond the value of the hardware, they may be a little more willing to understand. But um, one thing I'll have to say is, you know, if you don't have a relationship with local law enforcement already, when, if you're the IT asset management people, you probably should start. Because if you build a relationship with them before something bad happens, they're more likely to listen to you. Um, if you just call them out of the blue and say, hey, my laptop was stolen, I don't care. It's just another laptop. They'll say, go down to the downtown east side and go see if you can find it at the market because that's probably where it's going to end up. Or check Craigslist and let us know if you find something. But hey, don't, don't go and get it yourself because that's dangerous. No, you know, let's be pragmatic here, right? So make sure you ins you discuss the value of the data on the laptop and the potential implications of that data getting out in the open. Um, so what are your options? Encrypt your devices. Encrypt your devices. 
encrypt your devices. That's the single piece of advice that I can give you guys to take home is full disk encryption of your devices. Okay, sure, there are ways around some of that stuff, but listen, to the average thief, they're not going to get around like a, a full disk encryption. They're just not technically savvy enough to do it. Um, obviously, MVM and ITAM tools can help. We have good ones. So that's, that's good stuff. Um, but educate your users. Make them part of the solution. Now, there's a really cool um, kind of concept out there now that they call people-centric security, which kind of flips the security model around. It gets people more involved instead of just the technology. If you educate your users and say, look, you're carrying around a lot of very sensitive, potentially embarrassing or, or you know, damaging information to our company if it were to become out there, especially to our competitors, you may treat the laptop with a little, little more care. Last, stop leaving laptops in your cars, okay? I promise I'll stop doing it. So it's 40 minutes, I had 45 for questions, so I'm gonna wrap it up. How many people remember the wrap it up box? Wrap it up, we. Okay, so here's my contact information. I love to reach out on LinkedIn, so don't hesitate to reach out to me on LinkedIn. And now I got time for Q&A and swag. So I got a ton of swag, so just come up and help yourself. If you want some, I got shot glasses, I got t-shirts, they're all one size, so don't get upset if you don't have your size, it's just what I had. And I got tons of these little laptops, or these, these charging squid things. I'm not gonna throw these because they have like pointy ends, and I'm not responsible for someone's eye getting poked out. Questions? Or are you just stretching? Are okay. you actually gonna stop putting your laptop in your car? Probably not. <laughs> well, it's hard, right? Because I have this bag, right? And it's got my laptop, and it's heavy. And, you know, I got a rental car, and I'm going somewhere else. And I don't want to drag it around the mall or wherever. But listen, I should know better. So it, it's, it's, again, it's like anything else. You have to just teach yourself new habits. Hey. Yeah, so when a uh, laptop would be stolen, um, and it would be, uh, I guess, reported stolen. Would they immediately start doing the forensic investigation um, on every st single stolen laptop and then try and figure out what, what was wrong? So, like, I imagine tons of laptops would be stolen. Is every single one case investigated forensically to try and find um, something like, you know, heroin, drug rings, or whatever? Like no, that? So, so a lot of these cases are usually rather easy to, to determine where they ended up. But I mean, um, it's only like a very, very small fraction that end up in these in-depth, deep investigations where we found more things that either we need to be concerned about or we need to like get like serious law enforcement involved beyond like the local police department. The vast majority of these cases are just simple theft cases and then we can just track it down to a specific IP block and then usually pretty quickly we can determine what happened. Um, not very helpful. Uh, deploying the forensic tools to, to the laptops is, you know, far down the chain of, of steps that we'll take. Um, so, no, it doesn't happen very often. You mentioned uh, the BIOS works with Windows to install your toolkit. How well does it handle the OS X? Do you guys have copy trace for that? Or Linux, some other operating systems on the Dell system? So, um, we do have product for the Mac. I don't believe we have a product for Linux, but... Um, obviously, because Apple's very, very like tight when it comes to access to the EFI, that we don't have a host, host, okay. We don't have um, an EFI level piece for the Mac, but we do have uh, an agent that deploys on the Mac itself that's rather stealthy. Obviously, um, uh, cell phones, we have some, and then iPads, we also have another tracking tool as well. But um, uh, Linux, it doesn't really matter because it's a BIOS level agent. So if it's a Linux laptop, if, if you put Linux on it, the agent still exists in the BIOS. We just, you know, I'll have to check and make sure. Send me a note. I'll find out if we have a Linux agent. Do you see the uh, tools being built into the future to provide manufacturers? Well, so we've been doing this like 20 plus years, right? Um, um, the way it works with the OEMs is they just allow us to put this, this lightweight agent into the BIOS that allows us to then add more functionality to it as it's required. I mean, BIOS space is very limited, right? So you're not gonna be able to deploy a full forensic toolkit inside of the BIOS, and then really you don't need to most of the time. Yes, hi, uh, I was wondering how do you deal with cases when a laptop is unknowingly purchased by a law-abiding citizen 
And when you start doing your investigation, you start looking at personal details of somebody who's done nothing wrong. How do you deal with legal and privacy implications of that? Well, they have done something wrong, though. They purchased a stolen laptop. I mean, okay, they didn't understand that that's what they were doing, but what happens then usually is our investigations team will contact that person either by deploying a device freeze with an 800 number. And when someone who unknowingly purchased a stolen device is locked out of the blast and says, this device has been reported stolen, it belongs to this company, you need to call us at this number, they're calling right away because they think it's a mistake or something's wrong. Um, so in most cases, they're, they're um, pretty cooperative as far as getting the laptop back. I mean, look, everybody, you know, does something by accident, they didn't mean to purchase that, they thought it was legitimate, but at the end of the day, it's still a stolen device, and it still belongs to the person that it was stolen from, so, I mean, we can't really do anything like um, get them a new laptop or something. That ends up being them working with police to try and determine who they bought it from, where they got it from, and then trying to, to recover their losses some other way. Yes? So, how do you... Can you not just reload the BIOS? Like I said, like, I mean, there are hacks to do that, so. Except for the agent is provided as part of the BIOS. So even if I reload the BIOS, you're, you're still there? still there. Oh, okay, cool. Because we provide the agent to the manufacturer at the factory, and they integrate it into the BIOS itself, and when the BIOS is flashed on the device, the agent is there. So, you know, if, if you have that skill, then you're probably a pretty good thief already, so it doesn't really matter. Hey, yeah, I had a question. Um, yeah. I'm just looking over. Hey. Um, well, just actually just to clarify from that last question, he was talking about reflashing the BIOS, which I think is essentially what the manufacturer would do. So you're saying at that point, if they reflash the fresh BIOS, your product won't be there anymore. Well, no, because no, the BIOS has the agent inside it. When you go to ACES or Acer or HP or Intel or Dell or whatever, and you download a new version of the BIOS, whether it's an update version or an original version, the agent is inside that package. Sure. Right. So we provide you, it. To you them. could flash your own BIOS. Oh, or sure. Or an open source. Sure. But I mean, how many people have the ability sure, to write their own BIOS yeah. flashing, right? Sure. If you have that level of skill, you're probably in the wrong industry. Sure. I think there are open source ones. But my, anyway, my question was, um, you talked about forming a relationship with local law enforcement, and yeah. that just made me kind of curious. It's because it's like, yes, they're busy. This is a minor thing. So what's your recommendation as someone who works with those agencies or was part of one or was part of one? I missed the start of your talk. I don't know exactly. But, you know, how, what does that look like for me to strip your local police department? Like, are you just kind of checking in? I mean, like, how's everyone doing today? Well, are you bringing the donuts over? Uh, <laughs> what's happened in the past with some companies have done this is they, they just call up their local stolen property unit or, or they may have a contact or they know someone who knows someone. I mean, networking is really important. Right? And they'll say, look, we're about to buy 10,000 laptops. What do you think our best course of action is to protect these devices? Asking for advice, maybe. Yeah, yeah right? Okay. But you just, you know, you just want to start building that relationship with them and, and getting yourself known to them. I mean, I mean, as humans, we all have, you know, the, the, we're guilty of, like, leaning towards people we already have relationships with, right? So if you can get ahead of that game and start to build that relationship with local law enforcement, they're more willing to... to to chat with you in the future if something happens. All right. Um, so for Apple, they have like find my phone and I guess find my MacBook. Yeah. Uh, how does that compare with what you're talking about? Well, they're all largely very similar, right? Um, but I mean, I don't know too much about how, whether the, the find my iPhone, find my Mac is, is an agent that persists in Apple's BIOS or not. Um, it may. I, I'm not an expert on that. But you know, it offers a similar amount of functionality. But as far as work, we, we have the ability when we deploy that forensic toolkit for additional investigation, we can capture screen captures and key logs so we can gather really in-depth level of information on the thief. Yes. Uh, do you have the microphone? Do you have the microphone? Uh, sorry. So I have a question. Yeah. My name is Julius. Okay. Um, I am from Nigeria. I'm from Lagos, Nigeria. And Came here eight years ago, and some of the challenges we uh, we face as Nigerians who are either expert or who are trying to develop our skill set in this industry to be able to go back uh, to help with the law enforcement or some sort of uh, deterrent systems whereby people can actually stay away from crimes uh, to be able to do something legitimate. Uh, my question is, especially when you brought up the case study you did, uh, brother. Um, 
I think it's so important that I'd like to learn a little bit more about how your solutions or any other solutions out there could help some of us who are actually trying to do legitimate uh, business with uh, international communities and, uh, and whatnot. How, what sort of advice do you have for us maybe to use to go back to help educate the public and also those who are actually, who are actually committing this crime to stop or at least to reduce the rate at which they do it, which is affecting a lot of us here. Sure. I mean, that's kind of the $64,000 question when it comes to cybercrime in, 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 in Africa and Asia, um, in, in places like that, or Eastern Europe. I mean, I don't have the answer. I mean, the, the real problem is it's the risk versus reward ratio for these people in these places. It's so low. It's so hard to catch people in these places. Um, Law enforcement in many places, they're either, you know, they have some level of corruption or they, they just don't have the resources or they don't have the skill set or the abilities to, to do this. So as a technical professional in places like that, um, the best piece of information I can give you is just use your knowledge to educate everybody around you and then hopefully they'll take that message and share it with other people. I mean, this is still very much a human problem and not a technology problem. And until we can get a handle on... Um, catching these people who are literally launching millions of emails an hour trying to, to, to reel in fish. I mean, I don't think we're gonna solve the problem anytime soon. So I don't really have any good advice for you other than use the skills you already have to be able to educate those people around you. And that means other technical professionals and then um, regular people around you too. I mean, I spent a lot of my time trying to talk to quote unquote normal people, but what are some of the things they can do to be more secure? Yes. So I'm just curious. Where um, are you? Put your hand up. Hey. Hey, just curious. So you're basically adding a back door into. I knew someone was going to ask this. Any computer? Is there any oversight on uh, how you can access people's computers, or are you ever concerned about someone getting into your network and just deciding to access other people's computers? Of course, we're concerned about that. Who wouldn't be, right? This is a, pow a very powerful tool with a lot of sufficient capabilities, and if we're not careful in how that's deployed and, and managed. And yes, bad things can happen. Obviously nothing bad that we know of has happened. Um, but again, you know, you can call it a back door. We just call it the anti-theft technology. I mean, the it's the it's the intention that matters here, right? I mean, we're not randomly going out there and snooping on people. We don't have the ability to do so. I mean, it doesn't matter that the code exists on your laptop or not. It's dormant until you purchase the product and then act. You had a question? That was the question. That was the question. Okay, good. Is the hey, you already uh, asked the question? Yeah, I, I did. Uh, but but this is kind of a little bit related. On the bios, is that agent that you got there only for absolute, uh, or or do other? No, we're the only one who has it. You're the only one. Yeah. So this your solution is. It's our one patented that technology that we put out. And, and others world. others don't also have their own agents that know them. Not that I know of. <laughs> Not as far as like anti theft technology. Were you able to locate missing? Can you speak in the microphone? I can't hear. Uh, you. Were you able to locate missing hard drives? Uh, no. Um, if the hard drive is ripped out and replaced with another, we don't know what happened to that other hard drive. We're just monitoring the machine itself. So yes, if someone were to steal a hard drive out of a machine, it's full of all sensitive data. Well, then maybe you should super glue the next one or something. I don't know. Right there. Um, have you been identifying any suspic brand that lands in uh, Syria? For example, Toyota is very famous to have a lot of pickup landing sure. in Syria. So have you been identifying like a certain pattern, a certain brand that for I don't know which reason, people love to ship it there and are used for anything? I understand in Syria, internet is not available everywhere, but maybe something that uh, perhaps you have been identifying? Right, well, as far as a specific country like Syria, I mean, I'm familiar with the whole Toyota truck thing. That's the, 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 the favorite truck of terrorists worldwide, are these old Toyota pickup trucks, because they're construct, 
right? I mean, they end up places like Egypt and Syria and wherever. But as far as which specific devices, I would guess I don't have any specific information. I would have to be able to, to go and dig through our telemetry and find out. But I would suspect that they're probably very platform agnostic when it comes to hardware. They're just grab whatever laptops they can get and ship it. I mean, I, I don't know if there's any you know, uh, laptop or brand of choice when it comes to Syria. Okay, I got time for a couple more questions and then I'm gonna give away some swag. Hi there. I'm wondering, has there been any challenges where um, the wrong person got caught because they bought a stolen or was given the stolen laptop? Well, that depends what you mean by caught. Well, because obviously we do catch they, them, right? Basically, you track down someone with the yeah. laptop, but that person already was handed the laptop, maybe second or third hand already, right? From who originally stole the. Well, I think that's very similar to the question that was already asked in that. You know, at the end of the day, it's still a stolen device and it belongs to the person who legitimately purchased it. I mean, it sucks that someone else has gotten ripped off by buying a laptop of someone who stole it or someone else who pawned it off and it passed down the chain. But at the end of the day, our job is to return the laptop to its rightful owner, whether that be an individual or a corporation. So um, did they wrongly get caught? No, because they're obviously, they, they, they're in possession of a piece of stolen property and the original owner wants it back. Um, I was just wondering. Where uh, are you? Right here. Oh, hey. Hi. Um, is your the software is it installed by default on like consumer laptops? Is it? It's installed on millions of laptops, but it's not installed. It's a piece of dormant code in the BIOS, and um, until you purchase the product from us, it doesn't activate. So, like, if you were like to buy a laptop from like uh, like a certain store, like a MacBook, it would be installed by default. Well, you keep using the word installed, but it's not installed. It's just there as a piece of dormant code until you purchase the product from us and then it's turned on. So the code is on the is on the physical device, but it's not active. The flag Correct. is not turned on. Correct. Oh, okay. that makes sense. Thank so you. the bottom line is if you don't want it there, don't buy a device that has it. Oh, okay. Thanks. Is that it? Can I? Oh, okay. So if you wanted to avoid uh, this dormant piece of software, and like for example, I'm thinking the NSA could you know, come into this organization and say, I'm taking over all of the, the secret codes and activating all the devices and I'm gonna you know, access everyone who has the, the doctor. Um, is there a way of avoiding that? Huh. Can, I, listen, can I get rid of the Listen, I mean, codes? these questions are starting to get a little silly, but what I'll say is, is um, if you're the NSA, you got some serious chops. And the guy in charge of tailored access, the NSA, said, listen, I don't need to blow zero days. I don't need to waste time with all these complex state-sponsored, you know, special fancy attacks because 99 out of 100 devices don't have, they're not patched properly. They have things misconfigured or misinstalled. People just, they, they don't manage the devices properly. And they can find 100 of the ways in the device. Why do they need to attack the BIOS? They can get any device the other way. But what's to stop someone from the NSA or any other agency following you around until you leave your laptop in your car and then all it takes is a bat and they've got what they needed. So, I mean, you know, we have to be realistic when it comes to the capabilities of some of these agencies. We make it easy for these agencies to, to, to spy on us. Okay, anything else? Okay, I got four minutes to give away some swag. So I got lots of stuff here. Please just come take it all because I don't want to take it back to the office, okay? Thank you for listening. I appreciate it.